along with Gerald Billings from the Wichita office. So without further ado, here we go. Well, thank you. Um, you know, if you do get picked up by a tornado and get lofted high enough to be sampled by the radar, doable can do things to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's most likely what won't happen. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of speed through this a little faster than what I had planned, but hopefully you'll still get some good information out of it. Um, as a trainer, I always put objectives up, but basically the main things I want to talk about are um, what is dual pull, and then I kind of want to briefly describe the new products that are going to be coming out with it. And then Jared Lynn will talk more about um, how you can use those new products um, in an operational setting. So what is dual pull? Um, first off, the uh, logo up in the top was added when they changed it, so that has nothing to do with registers. But what dual pull is, is currently right now, they send only a horizontal pulse. Okay, with dual pull, we're gonna send both a horizontal and a vertical pulse. And what that does is, with a horizontal pulse only, you can only tell the size uh, from the return scatter, from the raindrops, hail, anything like that. But with dual pull, by sending both horizontal and vertical, we'll be able to tell not only size, but also shape and variety. Um, what are you gonna get with dual pull? Well, the first thing is, is you're, you're not going to lose reflective view velocity or spectrum width. You're still going to get those products. But what you're also going to get is what's called differential reflectivity, correlation coefficient, and specific differential phase. And I'll talk about those here in just a minute. Um, a quick product here is you'll also get what's called a hydrometer classification. Since we can tell the size, shape, um, variety, we can take a better guess of what we're actually seeing. We actually have an algorithm that can do that. Uh, melting layer. Uh, sometimes in reflectivity, you can't see the bright band, which indicates the melting layer. However, with the dual pole variables, it'll be much easier to see. And then I know there's going to be a QPE talk here towards the end, and just to kind of give you an idea, there's going to be nine new products uh, related to QPE with dual pole. Um, but to make that not sound so um, big, uh, the two things are there are going to be two instantaneous products. One's the hybrid hydro class, and that's just a hydro, hydro classification uh, product that's just had a filter run through it. And you're also going to go, it's called DPR, it's instantaneous precipitation rate. And uh, that's a new product that we don't currently have with the legacy system. And that, all that is is going to give you the instantaneous precip rate at any radar range. Um, the accumulation stuff, that's basically going to be the same thing as what you're getting now, except it's going to be using the dual pole variables to estimate the rainfall rate. And we're hoping with dual pole that is that it will give you better rainfall estimation. Um, but as with any good radar tool, it's going to take some time to mature, time to really get, um, get going. And then uh, you're not going to lose the legacy preset products right away, though. Um, they're going to stay there. And as kind of just to see how the legacy and dual pole are behaving together, there's going to be different products. Okay, so what is differential reflectivity? Uh, basically, it's the horizontal reflectivity minus the vertical reflectivity. Okay, and how would I interpret that? Um, let's say I have a raindrop that's horizontally oriented. Okay, so I'm going to have a larger horizontal dimension than I am a vertical dimension. Okay, is my horizontal reflectivity going to be larger than my vertical reflectivity or the other way around? And a raindrop, horizontal will be bigger. Yes, horizontal is going to be bigger. So am I going to have a positive or a negative CDI? Positive. 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 Okay, so that's basically how you interpret CDR, is that if I've got a horizontally oriented particle, I'm going to have a positive CDR. If I have a spherical particle, it's going to be near zero. And then if it's vertically oriented, um, I could have a negative CDR. Uh, the one caveat is that um, it is bias towards a dominant scatter. So if I have a very large hailstone that's mixed in with a bunch of raindrops, I'm actually going to bias my CDR towards that larger hailstone because it's still a reflectivity thing. It's still going to be um, biased by a diameter to the sixth power. And then here's what ZDR will look like. Uh, the reds indicate where you have the more oblate uh, stones or raindrops. Uh, where you have the blue is that's near to zero, and so that's where you've got more spherical particles. 
Okay, what about correlation coefficient? This is a measure of how similarly the horizontal and vertical pulses are behaving. And what's great about this is that it's a great discriminator between non-meteorological and meteorological echoes. Um, in non-meteorological echoes, it's typically going to be about less than 0.8. Uh, for meteorological echoes, it's usually going to be greater than that. Um, and if you've got very pure, like pure rain or pure snow, you're going to have very high correlation coefficients near about 0.99. Um, as you start to get mixtures of meteorological things, you're going to, that correlation coefficient is going to drop a little bit. You're going to see closer in between kind of that 0.8, 0.97 range. Okay, and here's what that looks like. And you can actually see right here where you've got the blues and the greens, that is biological scatters. That's the non-meteorological ever that you're seeing. Uh, the magenta colors are where you've got pure rain going on. Um, and we know we're below the melting level, that's why I'm saying pure rain. If we're above the melting level, you could say that it's probably like pure snow or pure ice, things like that. And then where I've got those yellow colors kind of mixed in with the magenta, that's telling me I've got a mixture of things going on. Or kind of towards the north, that's telling me I've got some melting going on. Okay, what is specific differential phase? This is the last product I'm going to talk about here. Um, basically, it's the range derivative of the differential phase shift. Okay, um, I'll kind of speed things along here real quick. This is what PDP would look like if we just gave you the differential phase shift and not the specific differential. If we didn't take the range derivative, you can see it's kind of ugly. It's kind of very hard to interpret here. However, if I give you PDP here, this is the range derivative. Now I can tell what's going on better at one specific point. PDP is a cumulative variable. As you go along a radial, the PDP increases continually all, all the way along the radial. So if I look at one specific point, it's not telling me what, about what's going on there. It's telling me what's happened all along that radial up to that point, whereas PDP is going to give me a better indication of what's going on right there at that point. And the great thing about KDP is it's a good indicator of the liquid water content, even in the presence of hail. How many of y'all deal with hail contamination in your recent products right now? I, I see a lot of hands raising. KDP is going to help mitigate that. Um, it, even in the presence of hail, you're going to be able to see where the highest liquid water contents are. Okay, so I'm going to quickly step through these. Some typical values that you'll see in rain. Uh, reflectivity anywhere from 10 to probably 60 dBZ. Uh, KDP is going to be anywhere from 0 to 5. There's not so much of a size dependency as that KDP is also dependent upon particle concentration, just like reflectivity is. Um, now, as far as size goes, ZDR will have a dependency. Uh, your smaller drops are going to be very near 0 dB, and as you increase in size, you can get to as high as 6 dB. And then correlation coefficient almost has an opposite effect. Um, it'll be 0.96 for the larger particles, and as you get smaller and smaller, your correlation is going to get to around 0.99. Uh, for hail, just a couple things I want to point out here is for classic hail, you, know, you typically have high reflectivity, but since hail tends to tumble as it falls, you have very low ZDR. Um, it basically appears spherical to radar, so your ZDR is going to be low. Uh, your correlation coefficients are going to drop just a little bit, but not a whole lot as long as it's pure hail. If it starts to mix with rain, it can get lower. And then, as I said before, KDP is going to be zero. This is why it's so great, uh, why KDP is great for hail contamination, is because hail does not contribute to KDP. Uh, the last thing I want to mention real quick is large hail. As Don kind of alluded to, Large hail has a very distinct signature, primarily with correlation coefficient. Um, when, cor when correlation coefficient drops below 0.9 and you're suspecting hail, you can probably say that there's at least a full size hail going on right there. And the reason for that is you get what's called me scattering um, with, uh, with particles that are largely golf ball. And that really starts to mess up correlation coefficient. Uh, in snow and ice, uh, the primary thing here to note here is that ZDR can vary quite a bit. This is due to particle, uh, particle density. 
Um, as you get higher density particles, your ZBR can increase. Um, also, you can get negative if they align vertically. Um, if they're oriented ver uh, horizontally, you can get some very high ZBR. So maybe we can start to tell differences between different types of uh, ice crystals, which I can help with snowfall estimation and things like that. Um, I think there's some good stuff there. And then lastly, uh, clutter and biological reflectivity and differential reflectivity. Um, those are noisy, kind of hard to tell, but one thing with differential reflectivity is the biologicals. Um, if you are interested in bird migration, things like that, we've noticed um, you can see patterns in ZBR. You can basically tell kind of flight patterns uh, using ZBR with the biological stuff. But again, correlation coefficient is going to be great at identifying this type of stuff because it's going to normally be below 0.8. So in summary, the base products, um, ZBR is going to be best for drop shape. Uh, CC is going to primarily be for non-meteorological versus meteorological echoes, but also it's going to tell you the variety of echoes that you have if they're in the meteorological realm. And KDP is going to be liquid water content. So I'm now going to turn it over to Jeremy real quick, and she can talk about how to apply these products. Hello. Uh, thanks. Uh, for, I'm really loud. Um, first off, uh, the people who have gone through some of the training, or uh, Clark and Mark, will notice that much of my presentation is WDTB. I have they've allowed they've shared it with me, and I have taken it and amended it, and molded it about three or four different times for three or four different groups of people. Basically, my talk is what can dual pole do for me as an operational forecaster. I've worked with it for about a year now with Ken Cook at the office. We've been doing different trainings, um, so on and so forth. Let me see if I go over here. Um, so Clark's going to help me. He's going he's gonna to stay on. Um, this isn't going to work, is it? Um, he's going to stay on the microphone and uh, tag team in. Uh, this, is, this is his life, uh, so he, he may be able to pull in some tidbits that I can't. Do I need to stay over there? Well, I think it's rubbing back there. I'll just hold it. All right, so basically Clark's uh, gone through this and we've got, uh, basically we've got our new base variables. We've got differential reflectivity, correlation coefficient, and specific differential fit. What are you doing to me, Gerald? <laughs> <laughs> I don't do this. Yours off. Yeah, that's all. Turn yours off real quick. Okay. 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 Wait, we're getting scammered, so okay. we'll just we'll turn off. Okay. All right. So we've got our our three new base variables. We're going to utilize those in concert with our Z, V, and uh, spectrum width to apply this in new ways. Um, so to start off, we're just going to jump right in for hail detection. How can it help me as a forecaster sitting at the desk for hail detection? Uh, hail widely varies in size and shape, but it tumbles. It looks spherical to the radar. Basically, it's zero. When Clark was talking about the size and shape, it looks in ZDR, um, the H and the V are one to one. So it looks zero in the in ZDR. So here's first, here's a storm in Oklahoma, all this data is from Oklahoma because we didn't have ours yet. Uh, so we've got this, we've got this supercell, got a large, large reflectivity um, core with it. Our, we've trained ourselves to know that that's likely hail. What can we do? Well, how can dual pull help us with that? Well, here's ZDR in this image. This ZDR, it's low, you can see right in the, um, Where's the pointer? Very tip. Sure, I'm gonna say it. The microscopic. Yeah. It's more oh. Okay. Well, the big circle. It's okay. 
I can stand. The big circle, we've got low to negative ZDR. That's, that's going to near zero. That's telling me there's hail or something different in there. You can see the white variety below, further below that. That's very high. That's in the five to six ZDR range. It's telling me they're very um, uh, horizontally large particles. Um, and it's going to be, it can be positive when it's mixed with rain. It does go to its dominant scatter, as Clark mentioned. Um, so it can be somewhat positive, but it's going to see a drop in it. For CC, you're going to see a lower, uh, lower values. Anything below 0.96, really, you get a mix of something. That's what I, that's how I look at it. Anything that's not purple, they've nicely color coded the, uh, the, color table for us that anything that's bright purple is the same they helped us out there so anything that's not that you're gonna get some large uh, you're gonna get something different and in this case it's gonna be hail here's KDP in this image you've got very large values of KDP this is due to melting hail um, but it can help us identify where there is the hail and you notice that in very areas of very low CC you're not going to have KDP. It's not calculated for 0.9. Am I correct with 0.9? It's not, it's not going to be shown for any value that's under 0.9 in CC. It just isn't going to be there. So you can see that black hole in the upper part of that circle. And that is where the CC was below 0.9. All right, so this is a real example. Pittsburgh was, I like to say, four, number four, because Pittsburgh and Wichita were installed at the same time. So I put us third. <laughs> I don't really know who finished first because I was on vacation. But uh, we were. where we finished, yes. All right, so, so I call Pittsburgh number four out of three for the beta test sites. But this is an example from them. This is a three-body scatter spike example. Again, we've taught ourselves that that's a three-body scatter spike. We see that in the data. That's fantastic. But what... Uh, what, how can uh, dual pole help us? I don't know if you see CC up there, it's bright blue. To me, that is just like a big flashing sign. Hey, look at me. Um, I've got a three body scatter spike. And the nice thing about this is in this case, it's isolated and you can see that three body scatter spike in the reflectivity. There may be examples where you can't see it. I remember Scott talked about this the other day. You may not be able to see the three body scatter spike down radial. With the uh, dual pole data, you can be able to uh, see that in there. The ZDR in a three body scatter spike is gonna become very positive and then go back down to negative. And again, with KDP, you are not gonna see um, anything below 0.9. And those bright blue colors are in the 0.4 range. So anything below 0.9, you're not gonna see. And one thing to remember with this, this data is as good as radar data is. It's only telling you what's happening at the radar beam level. Just because there, this is a degree, eight degree slice, just because there's hail there does not mean there's hail at the surface. And in this case, I didn't show all of it, but I believe this case, as they went lower down, that three body scatter spike disappeared. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, it disappeared, and also they had no hail reports at the surface, uh, but they did have very high winds at the surface. And you can kind of look there at the KDP and with those high values, uh, that might indicate that you have some water loading going on. Um, I know you can probably see that with the reflectivity, but it, you know, KDP is going to tell you that even more. It's going to give you even more information about what's going on. So, uh, but yeah, they had no hail report on the surface. All right. So I said I think the three-body scatter spike is great. I I used it uh, just last week when I was watching. There was a storm up in uh, just north of our area, and I could see a bright blue, bright blue CC. Uh, identifier on it. So it's just a great, it's a great clue. Uh, so strengths and limitations of de hail detection. Well, it's uh, going to be more robust than using Z alone. Yes, we can kind of tell that there's hail there. This gives us confidence, give, puts confidence in that warning for you. Um, you can see that hail signature in your ZDR and your CC, even if your Z is questionable. You got high, but you're not sure. It can help you detect significant hail greater than two inches. If you've got really low CC values, as Clark mentioned, you can, gives you confidence. I, 
can't say it guarantees it, but it's going to give you confidence that you likely have large hail. You can put golf ball with higher confidence in that, in that uh, warning or that statement update. Increase your values. It helps, uh, helps you with that. And the uh, three-body scatter spike is easier to detect. A limitation, it's not going to help you identify between marginally, and marginally severe hail and non-severe hail. It's just, it's not that good. Um, and it doesn't tell you what's at the surface. It's just telling you what's at that beam level. So you got to be able to use it as you would your radar, but just gives helps give confidence. Uh, tornadic debris detection. This is a big one uh, right now. So physical characteristics of tornadic debris, uh, it's variable size, it's different, um, completely different shapes. It's not meteor, they're larger than meteorological scatters because they're trees and parts of homes and uh, cars, <laughs> anything. So they're regularly shaped, they're randomly oriented and tumbling. So I kind of reorient, uh, re changed around this slide because what I was taught, and to me, the first thing that I'm doing if I'm looking for a tornado on the radar is I've got my velocity up or my SRM. And you cannot have a tornado being detected by dual pole radar, dual pole radar unless there's a tornado. So you got to have a couplet. So you got to look at your couplet first, find your couplet. Then you can look at your reflectivity data. Yeah, you've got re high reflectivity. Our big buzzword this year, it seems to be, is the debris ball. So you can say, yeah got a debris ball, but can you confirm that? Can you have confidence to that? Here's your ZDR. You've got near zero ZDR in this, inside of this circle, in a large area of it. It looks zero, it's random, it's or, uh, randomly oriented. And your CC, notice the big blue dot. Again, it's non-meteorological. Meteorological variables are in the upper range of that CC, and your non-meteorological variables are below 0.8. So, Again, it's just a, another confirmation factor. This can help you at nighttime. If you have a nighttime tornado, you don't have your spotters out. You can't see it. Um, it just helps give you confidence. It can be, I would say it can con this can confirm because you can't have it without. So what are some strengths? It indicates a tornado is occurring and is doing damage. It's, conf it's confirmation. Um, it allows you to have, um, tell where the tornado hit down or touched down roughly with your uh, with your main radar issues and errors but gives you a pretty good idea and it's limitations it's not a predictor of a tornado it's not going to help you in five minutes too it's not going to tell you one's coming um, it needs to be in close range you say 60 kilometers is the best yeah 60 75 i think we've seen it now past 75 a couple times but that's with large very large tornadoes large large significant tornadoes um and the big thing of all is it must hit something you can have a tornado but if it doesn't hit anything it's not lofting that debris into the air to be seen by your radar and it's mainly going to be seen at your lowest elevation slices unless it's really close to the radar it's not a magic ball. <laughs> All right, so updraft detection. How can, how can it help tell you where an updraft is? Well, there's ZDR columns. There's regions of liquid water. This is a region of liquid water that is strongly positive um, liquid water found above the environmental zero height. So liquid below zero. Should be frozen, but it's not. And how far up can that? We, we see that already, but how far up can it go and can you give confidence of how strong a updraft is? This is a FSI cross section of a supercell. In the bottom left, you have your vertical slice through your supercell. You can see your updraft in the white circled region. The two black lines, I didn't change these, but this is zero, negative 20. Didn't change the colors, but so you can see you've got an updraft. Now let's look at ZDR. You can see you've got positive values in the ones. The blue-green values clear above negative 20. That's indicating to you that there is a strong updraft. It's not going to tell you that you're going to have large hail or anything, but it gives you more confidence that there is a very strong updraft. There was a supercell earlier this year just traipsed right along the Oklahoma-Kansas state line, and it had a great viewer just
crazy bounded wheat gecko region. And the ZDR column, looking off of Vance radar, was, was right up there with it. The BUR tells you it's a strong storm. The ZDR confirms it as well. All right, into precipitation uh, estimation, the QPE. I'm going to go through a couple little examples here. Um, but why is this more important? Why is it helping us? Why is it better? Um, I've been told that this is the reason what the radar kind of got pushed through was to help. Is this big thing was uh, QPE. We'll see how that works. Um, but it should help you. It's identifying different environments. We've got um, tropical rain processes and cold rain processes. And you got rain mixed with hail. And right now, we just apply the same rain uh, distribution to all of our radar data to get a storm total output. That's not necessarily the best way to do it at all times. So how can this help? Well, the legacy precip, as I said, it's all one thing. The dual pole precip takes a, takes a hybrid scan hydro class, kind of identifies what each pixel is, and then applies a different uh, distribution or rain rate calculation to it to help it uh, to clarify what is falling, whether it's rain or something else, and, and how much of it there is. So this is a tropical situation. Uh, back when Norman had rain, Oklahoma had rain, they, um, they were able to get some data. So this, this uh, image here, we've got some high reflectivities. This is your ZDR. Notice it's, it's moderate. You got ones and twos in there. It's mostly blues, greens, maybe some yellows. A little bit, a little bit of res, but mostly in the moderate range. So you got, they're not the bigger drops are going to be more positive. So remember that. So you've got your kind of your smaller, medium-sized drops. Your CC bright purple. It's all one thing. There's nothing else in there. It's rain. So this is in June, so we're going to go with rain. Um, KDP. This is telling you how much liquid is falling in a point. So how much water is falling out of that? The higher values equal more liquid, more rain. What's the concentration? So you've got some ones and twos in there. So you've got, you got some good, uh, good rain rates, but they're not crazy. He, Clark knows better about exactly what goes with each one, the, like a, an exact rain rate. But this tells us too. We've got dual poles giving us a digital rain rate for every pixel. So it's telling us we've got two to three, well, about two inches per hour at that pixel, at this scan. It's updated every scan of the um, 88D, every time it goes around. So it's helping you give confidence to your storm total precipitation. So here, let's, the guys are tropical. What, how's that different from our continental? Here we've got a couple nice little cores, 50 to 60 dBZ. Our ZDR is much larger. We've got bigger drops in that in those cores. That's what that's telling me. Our CCs, eh, they're not all purple like the last ones, so maybe we have some hail mixed in there. Uh, it's not uh, not overwhelming, but it's it's not. Your KDP though is much higher. It's you've got some pixels in the orange. You've got some three to four. Um, in there it's telling you how much liquid's falling. And then this is your instantaneous rain rate. <coughs> We've got rain rates up into six, seven, even eight is the max up there listed. So it's telling you, helping you identify how much liquid, how much rain is falling out at each time. So it's improving your skill as a forecaster doing flash flood measurements. Anything with flooding would be helpful. It's limitations. All your standard radar limitations apply. Uh, biases are not currently applied that I understand. Uh, it should be one um, at this moment. And the relationships are derived empirically. And they're developed and we've only had the radar in a few locations. As the radar becomes more widespread, there are more case studies, there, that, those values may change, how this is applied may change. Winter weather, this is one I haven't experienced firsthand, but I'm really excited about it due to this data. So these variables help us identify the frozen versus the liquid or the homogeneous versus the non-homogeneous particles. We've got the melting layer. Clark showed you the melting layer and the melting layer 
algorithm. I challenge that you don't need the melting layer algorithm. If you look at CC, you got your reflectivity here. You might be able to tell me exactly where the um, bright band is or get a good idea, but the correlation coefficient tells you exactly where it is. To me, that's just, it's just there. <laughs> you can't argue with it. So I think that's, that's fantastic and it shows up in the ZDR as well. This is just an example of rain versus snow. Um, this is where I'm excited, so I hope it, when we get a winter of weather event, I hope it works out exactly like this. But I would challenge you to be able to tell me exactly, with this image, where it changes from rain to snow. This event changed from rain to snow. You can probably have a good idea based on our knowledge, but can you tell me exactly where? If you look at differential reflectivity, can you, does it help you? The smaller values, the blue values are more like snow. This line, to the left you've got snow. Point, uh, point 0.5 or less is, a, is ZDR for snow. Anything above that, remember you're getting bigger particles or melting, you're getting something larger. It's more oblong, or more horizontal in nature. I don't think I would have drawn that line exactly like that. So this helps us, this again is at the radar level, but it helps us identify where our transition line is with, if you're in the central plains in Kansas, you always have to deal with where's that darn transition line. Forecasting it, it's not gonna help you with that though. <laughs> All right, this is just another example, but this is noticing CC. This, again, reflectivity, I challenge you to tell me exactly where, where the transition line is. CC, does it help you? That bright purple color over near sparks even though you got some higher echoes, it's all one thing. It's all homogeneous. You're not uh, changing. Whereas on the right-hand side of that line, you've got widely varying hydrometeors. Um, you've got probably some rain, some snow, some sleet, all the above. So it helps identify that. And so I'm really excited to see it work. So how can this, what can this do for me? Uh, basically in conclusion, this helps us identify new features, or at the very least, it helps give us confidence as meteorologists at a warning desk or doing a forecast in the winter to identify what we're seeing and put out a higher confidence forecast with that and portray that information to our partners and our customers. That's it, and we'll open it up to questions about that. We tried to do this as just a um, little training because the rest of the day is going to be dual poll, and we wanted to give at least everybody a a chance to understand <laughs> what the rest of the day's talks are if you haven't had the training, the full training. Yes? What can it do for me? One of the things in the briefings that they give to the private sector meteorologists is that it was going to cut down on ground clutter. Since you've been dual polarized, you've got more ground clutter than I've seen at the Wichita radar since the ADAT was installed. What's we, going on? We lost a fabulous algorithm that will come back. We had a, uh, with an update um, a year or so ago, we had the clutter mitigation detection, CMD. And it dynamically, volume scan to volume scan, identified clutter and took it out. Since going back, since installing dual pull, we've had to not use that. We can't use that because they had to stop the software um, development at a certain level so that they could build their dual pull software on top of it. That was at a build that did not have uh, CMD or clutter mitigation but, with it. But we were told that installing dual pull would give us less ground clutter. Where, where did that come from? I, I don't I, I don't think I, we were ever told less ground clutter, Mike. What you yes, were told... No, that, no we were Well, I, I don't know why you were told. What you should have <laughs> been told was that you were going to have a better ability to discriminate between yes. precipitation mm -hmm. yes. and non-precipitation. Yes, and it does a fantastic job at that. Excellent. It, it identifies, even even though we have more clutter, you're seeing a lot more clutter because we, we're trying to take it out. We're trying not to use all bins because it, it alters the dual pole data some. So we try not to use it so you'll see more clutter. When we have uh, AP, I, we had it the other night, and it identified that as AP. It showed it as not real. It did not calculate in the precipitation estimates. It identified it as clutter. So it is identifying it correctly as clutter. I can t attest to that from the Wichita Radar. 
Uh, we've noticed an awful lot of variance in the reflectivity on the Vance, uh, which was, I guess, beta one or, or one of the Alpha, one I believe. First, yeah. <laughs> so, um, has that problem been fixed? I mean, some days it'll just be the hottest radar in the country, and then some days it'll be cool, 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 and it just seems like seems like signal strength is just very like wild since the dual pole installation there. I know some stuff was just updated with the Vance radar that should be. But I, I don't know. I don't know how it was affecting the variance and the reflectivity. Don, I mean, do you remember from the data quality meetings hearing that, or well, I don't there, remember. There've been some issues with the with advanced radar over time, some equipment yeah. issues, and even though dual pole was installed, there's there's also been some equipment upgrades that have gone along at the same time, and. And it's I showing, think and it's we showing just more had, stable now. So we just had the last one the end of July. So it should be more stable now. If you're yeah. still seeing it, that could be a problem. Uh, also, Clark, you might mention CMD comes back with Bill 13, yes. which is yes. springtime. Yeah. So we shouldn't be without CMD for too long. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. I've been told like May. That makes me sad because I want it to be like next month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was, okay. what no, that's what I was oh, Yeah. Well, I, I started to, but then, oh, okay. then I got distracted. So, but yes. Yep. Thank you.